I was thinking maybe we could start if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how you started vocalizing when you were a little kid. Yeah. And your kind of entry into being a vocalist, but also kind of exploring sounds with your own voice. Sure. When I was a kid, I didn't know I was vocalizing. Um, well, I became a musician, and uh, uh, I'd say in somewhere in my uh, mid twenties, I heard uh, overtone singing, and I was blown away by it. Um, I'd seen a documentary on some Tuvan singers or something like that, and I was like, "Wow, I've never seen anything like that before. It was so powerful." And I wanted to felt like I I could do it, and I wanted to do it. So I started taking longer showers, and then uh, <laughs> you know, practicing in the car on my commute and things like that. Uh, and then eventually, I uh, so started doing some other vocalizations, and then around that time, a group of us uh, were in Boston, and uh, we started performing. And uh, and that was when I was still in graduate school, and so I had a burgeoning career as a composer, writing pieces for other people to play, and I lived uh, a double life. I was a composer, I wrote pieces for other people on paper, and... And so I was a performer, mostly of improvised music right, uh, with my group. And uh, about eight years of doing this, I had an opportunity to kind of bring those two aspects of my life together with a concerto for myself. And uh, around that time, when I started writing this concerto for myself, I was analyzing the different sounds I made septones, throat singing, other kinds of multiphonics and things like that uh, to help orchestrate my piece. I also discovered these cassette tapes I made when I was six, right? And I remember um, I had a tape recorder and I was making non-linear music concrete, but I was also vocalizing and it turns out I was singing multiphonics. So now I think maybe when I heard multiphonic singing, I was maybe subconsciously um, predisposed to it. And in some way, as many things uh, develop and blossom linearly in life, uh, there's an aspect maybe of this, this personal practice that's kind of reaching back to a kind of essential self that just is, was and is. So I, I had a a complicated childhood. We traveled a lot. I was born in New York, but when I was about eight months old, my family, we, we moved to Japan. And we always speak, spoke, and still speak Japanese at home. Uh, but then, when I was four, we moved to Switzerland. And that's around the time that I was really becoming more fluent, and my internal life was, uh, you know, the internal dialogue was really becoming to kind of um, develop. And uh, I, was, I was mute again, you know. I didn't speak French, and uh, uh, I ended up spending a lot more time alone. It's also already challenging for a little kid to move to a new place, you know, but then also it, a completely new culture. And uh, I started going to uh, international school, and that's where I first learned English. Right? And uh, around that time, I was given this tape recorder. And I think now that uh, maybe my tape recorder was my best friend at that time. And it was, it was a way for me to kind of manage and have agency over the sounds around me when maybe I felt like I, I, I didn't, you know, or it was losing that growing sense of agency with language and uh, ability to kind of communicate and uh, uh, for some reason I was being creative and playing with you know but maybe that was my first instrument I think um, and um, I didn't really think of it as such until much later I, no one had told me that uh, that a, a tape recorder can be an instrument that uh, making these weird sounds could be a uh, vocal practice, you know. Uh, especially early on in music school, it seemed, um, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me. I didn't have mentors, I didn't have, we weren't even talking about music. That uh, 
um, featured recordings or or extended techniques yet, you know. Um, so uh, as I became more aware of non-Western vocal traditions and also people working with their voice in more uh, extended ways, that became inspirational, as well as becoming more aware of a broader range of sonic possibilities than uh, just the Western classical canon that I was really being and immersed in early in my training. And then uh, a lot of it was just uh, somehow uh, doing it, yeah. And having a group of people who encouraged it and who were also discovering their own ways with their uh, instrumental practice. I was lucky to, that we, we grew up together. And and having this parallel uh, art practice development and, and then eventually working to see where these different interests and practices within myself also overlap. It's, it's really like um, seeing how uh, different languages you speak also represent different cultures and then seeing how they are, are manifold within yourself, you know. Um, yeah, does that answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listening to those tapes, it's yeah. interesting um, yeah. thinking about that also in the context of when you were learning a new language because yeah. I think a lot of learning a new language that's so different, you know, yes. the, especially from Japanese into mm -hmm. French mm -hmm. and English, yes. um, is these sounds that are not in the other language that are a lot more, the kind of the way you have to make your mouth in a different shape and the way that you have to kind of use your breath in a different way to yes. get the different consonants out especially. Um, and so mm. to have that be the point where you were kind of focusing on these with your voice and then also exploring with other things is really interesting from those tapes listening. Yeah, to I had, um, I, uh, now that I think about it, so some of the uh, more uh, semantic moments are accounting. I count in Japanese, right. and then also count in. I do it like a count off, like I'm, I'm beginning a, a band leader. You know, I go a one, a two, a three, four, five. I mean, <laughs> it didn't occur to me in like like a five four a song would be weird. You know, and they just, so there's like a, a a moment in the tape that where English is also creeping in. Right. You know, and then I, I guess some of the vocalizations were kind of stylized noise in kind of an English manner. You know. While I'm also doing um, this, this kind of auto archaeology there too, I have my mom. Uh, I, I recorded my mom yelling at my brother. You know, that's still in it. <laughs> and then uh, a little moment in there where I'm, I, I'm, you know, little Ken is apologizing too. You know, this, so uh, I kept it in. You know, it's in the piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, at the end of the tape part. At the beginning, I said, "Oh." And then it's like a confessional to the tape, you know, after I've been yelled at by my mom. I said, like, oh, you know, so I did the thing I was not supposed to do, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's at the beginning of my concerto, you know, so maybe, um, I've, uh, maybe the concerto. And our practice is a way to stop apologizing. That's interesting, connecting that, this idea of auto-archaeology into the piece that you're presenting here at Impact that you're calling yes. History of Breath. Yes. So if you could talk a little bit about uh, both the, the fact that it is such a personal piece and especially certain aspects of the instruments mm. that you're using. Yes. Um, and why you titled it that. Yes. Um, one of the, well, there are instruments I've been performing with um, for a long time and for not as long, and then a, a brand new uh, instrument in this piece. The instrument that I've been performing with most is the, is the megaphone. For maybe about the past 10 years, I've been incorporating it into performances. That came about because I started performing in more unusual um, architectural spaces, and I, I wanted to be mobile to kind of articulate the different kinds of resonances and echoes and uh, the, the features of reflectivity. You know, if there's like a glass corner uh, or a, a long hallway or a really resonant stairwell, um, to think about uh, register and uh, as well as projection and uh, to kind of structurally feel the, the megaphone being able to throw my voice, direct my voice at those features um, was something that I, I've been learning 
And then after a while, I, I developed some techniques that I can only do with the megaphone, you know, a certain uh, clicking, circular breathing kind of things, as well as different kinds of um, uh, feedback that got a shape in my mouth that I could also sing with to create multiphonics and these kinds of things, while also circular breathing. Um, and uh, the instrument that is uh, uh, still relatively new, uh, but I've been using for about two years, are these uh, feedback bowls. Essentially, it's a circuit with a microphone and a transducer, and the transducer is affixed to a plastic fishbowl as a resonator. And it's quite sensitive to uh, you know, the distance between the microphone and the, you know, the resonant chamber, the fishbowl, and also things like my hand pressure on the bowl. And um, I could also sing into that as well to create different tones. And um, uh, I've been using that in several pieces, both as installation, uh, live performance, as well as in a chamber music context too. The newest instrument is a, a CPAP machine. I have been uh, I've ha uh, suffering from apnea most of my life and uh, a couple of years ago I uh, finally went and got a, a sleep study and they outfitted me with this this machine you know this, this thing that I, I describe it as a kind of um, a World War II Spitfire you know, pilot kind of gear, you know, because it, it covers the whole face in this air thing, you know, and just being outfitted with this thing so that you could breathe in another atmosphere, which is for a condition that's supposed to be most natural to a human being to be able to sleep, right? That's just, um, it also made me feel about uh, more estranged also somehow uh, from uh, just uh, most people around, I guess. I mean, I did some research and I f found out that uh, it'd be about seven, between seven and eight percent of Americans suffer from apnea, you know, that people who've been diagnosed with it, rather more. But that's more than Asian Americans, you know, <laughs> in America. Um, and what it turned out, though, I tried using this thing for several months. I never got used to it. And then uh, the air pressure, maybe it's a question of the air pressure being attenuated better, but it, uh, my apnea is bad enough that at a certain part of my sleep cycle, the air pressure is so strong that that wakes me up, you know. But then over the course of these many months, uh, I got used to being awake with this air pressure, and then I, uh, counting sheep, uh, I was um, vocalizing against the, the air pressure, and I thought, wow, this is an instrument, you know? And uh, in a way to kind of, well, well part auto-archaeology, but also I, uh, uh, some modicum of revenge against this thing, and then that have, that's also created some sort of frustration too. I still can't sleep, um, to, to foreground it as an instrument. And then, and then I thought, well, I have the megaphone, this thing, you know, that these are uh, maybe different evolutions uh, or uh, developments in my life, uh, uh, different kinds of breath. Yeah. So there, there are different uh, aspects of uh, extending my voice with some sort of device, some mediation, and they also represent different uh, uh, closeness to uh, biographically to. I guess, I mean, the megaphone I've, I've been with the longest, right? and then uh, this this new thing. The beginning of the piece, I have um, these little speakers that I've used in different installations, but I've also uh, gotten to use them in live performance as well. It starts with a recording I made uh, in my apartment in Hong Kong. I was living in Hong Kong last year, and. Uh, one of the days I had to spend indoors was during hurricane typhoon. They call it typhoon over there. Typhoon Mangut is one of the the strongest typhoons in um, recorded history of, of Hong Kong. And um, there were some sounds you could uh, when I had the window open. It was, there's more of a mix of sounds outside and the hurricane and the rain and then 
you can hear the water um, on the surface of the building. And there's a lot of metal too, because every apartment in Hong Kong has uh, air conditioners that stick out from the window, right? So you hear the, this uh, drizzling. And then as I closed the window, there were more sounds within uh, the infrastructure of the building and then the, the kind of creaking and then the um, um, uh, metal features as well, kind of ringing and resonating. And then uh, uh, the effects of the typhoon playing against the window or windowsill are, are present. And then it's some sort of... Uh, I think of it as a, a kind of transposition of a, of a memory of this physical stress in an architectural space and then transposing it into the concert hall. And uh, uh, at a certain point, some of those wind, you know, environmental sounds also begin to sound breath-like too. It's just like the, uh, the, the city, the apartment, the building is also breathing. And um, I want to transition into the, these other instruments, uh, other more uh, probably physical moment there too. But while I have these speakers, I'm not vocalizing it, but I'm still performing. I'm being present. You know? And there's a certain amount of time that I feel like just showcasing presence and sharing that with the audience also highlights an aspect of the architecture that we're inhabiting, this moment, this space that we're sharing together, that this time, you know, uh, and probably maybe more palpably so than uh, uh, a traditional performance. And if I started vocalizing from the beginning, you focus so much on that the physicality of it that um, I thought by doing away with that, we could foreground the, the presence and time more and then we transition more and more into the, the other instruments and at the end it's just me and the megaphone it's just much more visceral so there's like a large scale uh, crossfade if you will and uh, along the way the the recordings on the, the tape part are also dialogue with the CPAP moment as well as the feedback bowl moment that are the recordings I've prepared so that I could perform in counterpoint with those environments as well. Another aspect of the piece is a uh, unfolding um, counterpoint of uh, use of articulation of sound in space. Right. So at the beginning, it's moving these little speakers all around, and you hear these the space open up with that. And when I go to the CPAP, um, one of the uh, I wanted to to utilize the great uh, ambisonic possibilities of the space. You know, there's all these 36 speakers in the space. And uh, so there's a microphone on my CPAP to get some of the subtle sounds of you know, changing vowels and then the air leaking, you know, when I contort my face in different ways. And then, but there's a, we have, um, they gave me an iPad so that I can move the sound around in the space. So uh, I, I, uh, as I'm changing vowels, I slightly move and then when I get some air leakage, then it's a bigger gesture, so it moves, you know? So um, uh, that's one of the ways that we want to instrumentalize the, the special possibility in this amazing space. And then when I go to the uh, feedback bowl from there, the um, it's a microphone, and then uh, we're using, you know, the ambisonics, but uh, on a random walk. You know, it's facilitated with a little patch and max MSB. Uh, going to the megaphone and we do away with all those electronics and everything but it's um, because I have the megaphone and I'm used to being mobile uh, I, I walk around and then there are uh, we have eight we've set up eight different microphones but each microphone is mapped to uh, a discrete uh, speaker location right. so um, that's a different way of articulating space as well uh, uh, so uh, I'm also tracking in the, in the feel of the piece the, what I'm also perceiving and I also hope in part that also comes across to the audience is how the, the sounds are coming differently and then the space is opening up or closing and, and a lot of these sounds are intimate you know like the CPAP is just right here you know uh, as well as the feedback bowl it's very you know inside and 
the megaphone, it projects out, but some of the sounds are also really yeah. intimate inside my mouth. And uh, so the, the, the subtle technology, hopefully, helps make those, the physicality of what's really just inside my face more, more palpable out there uh, in dialogue with the space. Uh, we've talked a little bit about different types of composing and mm -hmm. this, especially in this type of piece where you're writing for yourself. Yes. Uh, when you're structuring a piece versus when you're notating uh, traditional classical mm -hmm. concert music yes. with a capital C, yes. uh, how are those processes different or similar for you? Um, I know there's some crossover in the way that you mm -hmm. kind of structure in a, a broader sense, but what is that process like in those two different forms? Oh, uh, writing for other people and then writing for myself? Yeah, I guess, or kind of the, the difference between when you're writing a piece that you're notating versus when you're conceiving of a piece that you're going to perform that doesn't necessarily have a notation. Hmm. Uh, I write differently for different people. And so uh, most of my music is person-specific. What I mean is uh, they're initially conceived so for one, one person to play. Sometimes these pieces are so person-specific that as of yet only that one person can play it. You know, Like my concerto, aforementioned concerto for myself, um, maybe somebody else will play it, but is the, I, I'm not designing it to be transportable, you know, because I am also kind of reacting to the the legacy of Western classical music, and then the kind of transportability that's implicit as a as a uh, as a conceit. And I remember uh, some of my teachers saying, "Well, if you got a good string quartet, then you can just sit around and any string quartet can play it," you know, and then. I was thinking about that, and then um, thinking about maybe some of my favorite listenings, uh, like a uh, big fan of Coltrane and Jimi Hendrix. And I was thinking, um, uh, would I, you know, would I have the same feeling if it was a cover band, you know, somebody else playing Little Wing or Giant Steps in a, you know, Sunday brunch or something, you know? <laughs> That'd be a cool Sunday brunch if they play Giant Steps anyway. Right, but uh, there's something about knowing that it's that person that's really special. I, as I was beginning to uh, kind of unpack my favorite listenings like that, you know, as a fan and listening to sounds and how it's mapped to like a specific person I admired, uh, I heard a lecture at Harvard by B.B. Uh, King. And he had his band and he demonstrated what he does how he does you know he says oh i'm gonna play uh, a a blues 12 hour blues and his band they were doing a blues for sure and he said i'm gonna play the right notes and it's like fifth position a pentatonic and yeah okay yeah. and then he stopped he said um now i'm gonna play the same notes but turn it on and i was listening and i said yeah i would write it the same way Maybe, you know, maybe be too much information if I, the other, but all of a sudden it was like, whoa, that's B.B. King. He could control, even with the same notes, the thing that something project his aura uh, that we could feel. And it was so palpable and that's why everybody was there, right? Because we know B.B. King to be B.B. King. And that thing that he turned on is why he's B.B. King and everybody else just plays guitar, you know? So it's also uh, in pursuit of that turning it on that I, I trust with uh, my favorite collaborators. The, you know, I say instruments are not instruments, they're people. And you can take different risks uh, and different kind of emotive possibilities that can be woven, design, by curating the energy of uh, and the possibility of these people. You know? And then uh, another thing that I've been kind of thinking about too in terms of classical music besides the transportability is that I think Beethoven um, teaches us to be afraid of death. 
You know, there's this thing, and I've had so many people tell me, you write person-specific music, and then what's going to happen to your music 200 years from now, you know? And then, so this obsession of something that's, that's kind of like, you know? Uh, we have this advantage now that we are in a different technological era than the time of Beethoven. In, in my lifetime, I was able to hear Coltrane and Hendrix. They didn't write their music, you know? But maybe the, the technology that allows them to live in my ears might even be more robust than the, than the Beethoven sonatas as written down. Who knows, you know? But uh, in my listening, the, the identification of that special person is important enough that I've been trying to find, investigate in different ways to bring that into classical music, you know? So, um, that's in that part. I think that, that to answer your question, though, in terms of notation and design, there's different kinds of research to address uh, the possibilities with a collaborator than one with myself. Of course, if, if it's, I'm writing for myself, I, have to, I don't need to notate as much because uh, I know what I'm going to do, right? And uh, but uh, for for my collaborators. There's a period of research and provocation. I know you could do this on the trumpet, you know, but can you do this? And then a negotiation with uh, an invention of a syllabary together for notation. Does this make sense for this technique? Then, right? Oh, it'll be easier if it's this. It's clear if it's this, you know? So we develop a, a, a kind of small uh, notational culture together. Uh, and I have these YouTube videos to kind of. Um, demonstrate something, right? Because if you write, have a notation, if you invent a syllabary, unless you physically demonstrate what those sounds and how those sounds are made, it, it, you can't map it, you can't imagine what it is, you know? And so the, the YouTube clips I have, they're also fun, and you know, these people are making weird sounds, you know? But they're extensions of the score, in that sense. So the notation has these things done in a very traditional way too, right? Because Notation, I say, uh, has to address the performance culture of the person you're collaborating with, you know. So, uh, I am lucky enough, I have uh, been trained in Western classical music, and if my collaborators happen to be professional orchestra members, then it's most appropriate to try to engage with them in notation that looks more comfortable for them, right? I don't just want to provoke them and then just learn it, you know? And uh, if I w uh, maybe was wanting to design a piece that's uh, more like something that I, I do on my own, then it would t require more time with an orchestra, you know? And then, so there are also these logistical uh, possibilities based on these different subcultures of uh, performance collaborators that I also have to be savvy and respectful as well. Uh, to be able to still within negotiating the landscape of, of those, shall we say, constraints or realities, be happy or with imagining a, a sonic outcome that I would be happy with too, right? So uh, a lot of it's really cultural, you know, and then those are the differences. But hopefully, I think from my end, uh, the the core mission, if it remains the same, that I want to uh, make music with sounds that I love, and I want to be uh, a, um, on a journey to discover uh, new sounds that are exciting to me, and then sometimes that means uh, with different collaborators, you know. Uh, so that court back bound, backbone of the mission, I, I, I don't see as many, much difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the articulation of the you know how of the performance practice might look a little bit different. And in that sense, it's kind of dealing with the history of of their education and performance and experiences from the individual. Absolutely. Performer that's working with Because I also perform with people who can't read music. Right. And then in that case, maybe there's a, a kind of a curating an energy with performing them together or agreeing on some sort of um, temporal map or other things or just rehearsing a lot and then over that 
you, you learn together what might be appropriate to do, you know, or you want to do, or also things you don't want to do, you know? Yeah, but those are different uh, uh, notations, you know? Yeah. Somehow, though, I found there still is uh, kind of pervasively uh, existent uh, a kind of cultural prestige for uh, notated music that seems somehow more rigorous or something to some people um, who go to the classical music. Or they, I've also heard, uh, well, you didn't notate that, you know, then how can you do that again, you know? Uh, well, there are different solutions for that. If I wanted to do it again, you know, there's like memory or different kinds of documentation or th different ways to practice too. Uh, but I, I, I wonder if there's also a, a latent sense of the cultural value of Western classical music that's seen because of Beethoven's are so great that if it isn't, if the, your output uh, does it notationally look more like that? Then it's it's somehow less um, uh, you know, legit, you know. Uh, so um, I'm I've also become aware of that to certain audiences too. I think especially through contemporary music, I was kind of related to some some of the other things we were talking about about. Uh, what is modern and what is avant-garde and what is experimental um, and does that have to be mm -hmm. within the context of uh, Western? Like, does that necessarily mean modernizing in a Western way versus uh, taking kind of modernization through different cultures and what it means to kind of bring, mm. kind of be experimental in art through different lenses? Yes. Um, that kind of gets uh, often watered down in descriptors in in kind of the Western new music scene. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Southeast Asia and these places where um, the economies are really blossoming, you know, and then so there's much more support for uh, art now than ever before. And I go to these places and then I see how exciting the local scene is. But there is still in some of those places. Um, a sense that that Western art culture is 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 the paradigm, you know, and uh, it for some of these places like Hong Kong and Singapore, there's the history of neocolonialism, you know, and then so the the you know the prestige markers are you know not only um, things like Western classical music, and then that's also part of the training. Right, so all the conservatories you, you learn to play in the symphonies, and, the, and then a lot of these places also have that in the, uh, institutionalized with government support, but not as much support for the, the you know, the, lo the local cultures of music making or art making, and or sometimes they look down upon it. You know, I mean, these things are changing. You know, I think, uh, for example, in Korea, the you know tr traditional um, musicians are. Um, and then music practice is highly respected, and then they have uh, the schools, and um, even in some of the music departments, they have two kind of departments together, you know, traditional music and Western classical music at the same time, you know? So that, that feels much more uh, even, you know? But um, I think, yeah, you raised the question of what modern might be, and for these burgeoning economies, uh, a more you know developed economy like in the West might seem, and the things that uh, the West culturally represents might seem to express a kind of modern. Um, but if we can get beyond that, I think there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, everywhere a sense of indigenous contemporaneity that we could uh, be more brave in embracing. And um, what uh, I've, I've come to also feel in, in part, some of my Western classical training, is that there is um, a, a body that is seen as more proper way of making a kind of vocal sound or you know, a compositional practice. And then we're supposed to contort our bodies to fit that. You know, like I say, it's a, a kind of a corset, you know? Um, 
uh, but there uh, might be uh, locally more exciting and also organic to our, their bodies and our bodies sounds that we can make that don't fit into, the, you know, and I, I like to point to my own vocal practice too. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of opera singers told me, oh, that's not singing, you know, because I'm not making a proper, you know. The, yeah, so it's as if if you don't fit in, it's like noise, uh, something that's outside of the signal, and then it's outside of the realm of what really communicates or the system, right? But as we uh, strive towards a more diverse world, a democratic world, then uh, maybe that it will be become increasingly more important to embrace those other sounds to and the ways that these different bodies um, communicate and, and to give space f so that we can listen to them and um, so people ask me what I've had people ask me what do you want people to take away you know from experiencing your, your art you know, if there's one thing and they're like what one thing <laughs> I think about so many things but like one thing what do you do you know and I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought about it. Hmm. maybe uh, hope. Hmm. If I could do, I'm so lucky, you know, I get to play around with sounds, like these instruments and stuff like that, and I just um, scream into my megaphone, and, you know, I get, I get to do this, and I get to, to live from doing this. So if... Um, you, and I, I hope that also translates to people saying, "Well, you know, I want to. I have this thing. I want to make sounds. I'm really, I'm really interested in this, but I don't really make music." You know, and th th these people could be also uh, uh, emboldened <laughs> in part by you know seeing the weird thing that I do. So, what are you working on right now? What's your next project coming up? I know you have. Uh, a couple things this weekend, yes. so much that you can't even be at one of your premieres. <laughs> a piece being premiered uh, on Saturday in, in Lausanne. It's a piece for tenor saxophone, a string quartet, and a double bass. Yes, for an ensemble there uh, for my friend Vincent Daou. We've known each other for many years, but um, yeah, yeah, we've been in touch and we've been performing together as well, and uh, uh, yeah, he's open to everything, and then we've been Skyping a lot, you know? and uh, I've got an instrument, and I've got another saxophone, and some of these things, and uh, yeah, I, I, I look forward to um, hearing it, yeah, uh, that's, uh, and then after that, let's see, next week, I go to Mexico, uh, I have a piece for trumpet and electronics for Andy Kozar from the bank fair, yes. And there's a festival there uh, in Morelia, a place called Simmas, C M M A S. Right? That's the center for electronic music. It's kind of like the the earcom of uh, Mexico, and then it's their fifteenth anniversary. So as a person who's had residencies there before, you know, they're kind of inviting some of the people um, in the past there for this thing. And uh, we'll also be giving a talk. And after that, I go to uh, Hong Kong for a residency at the Osage Gallery. And I'm doing a, a three-night, uh, yeah, uh, set of events the first night calling the vessel. The main gallery there is this long hall, so uh, I, I did some tests with my megaphone and it's quite nice some you know, short attacks, like, you know, and you can feel it kind of resonate and bounce through the hall. So I'm doing a site-specific installation performance. I'm making a piece in which one of the instruments I'm going to use uh, here, the feedback bowl, I'm going to make eight of them and then I'm going to suspend them from the ceiling on both sides of the wall so I can aim my sounds at them and have them kind of, uh, uh, activate the space you know, there. 
and uh, I have uh, I've been making some videos too. So in a smaller viewing space, I have a three-channel video piece, mm -hmm. um, and that piece uh, I went to a small village in Yunnan uh, with a collaborator, and uh, there's an ancient uh, theater there, but you can't use it. You can't go up at the is the building so old that they prohibit you from getting onto the stage that's visible in the the square, right? So my collaborator, uh, she has a megaphone and she screams, screams in this public space, screams for thirty minutes until she loses her voice. Well, you hear at the beginning it sounds like she's trying to control her voice more, like singing, and then the the roughness that happens in the throat. Um, happens over time. She kind of learns to, to scream over the course of it. And then it's really taxing to, you know, to, to vocalize for that long. So then you see, and then I have other cameras looking at the audience. There are people who are totally ignoring her and uh, taking selfies. There are kids who are mimicking her and uh, screaming, you know. Okay? And then there are also other people who are kind of like watching, watching, watching eating snacks. And it's kind of this, uh, yeah, in this space. And then how people, and they just walk by, or this life happens, you know, like Icarus falls as well as stops. Um, so the, this is a, a piece in which I thought about kind of transposing a bit my vocal practice to someone else. And I also thought about the counterpoint, well, another aspect of my vocal practice is this difference between semantic and non-semantic utilization of the voice. And uh, I've also been thinking about um, uh, uh, the kind of politicization of sound in the body and uh, conditions in different parts of the world now and reacting to it and um, a, a scream is physically palpable it, it, you can feel it but if it's wordless you can't censor it you, know? you can't really say this, this is you know so those are some aspects that I've been trying to develop as well uh, and then besides my composing and making sound art installations, thinking about how that could also go into um, different kinds of medium. This is a way that I'm also stretching in, in, to, in this piece. Uh, the second, so the, that the first night are those pieces, as well as two pieces I wrote for percussionist. And the, so that's like more about a written piece or a piece. The, the second night of my um, residency there, we have a academic uh, panel and uh, we have some, uh, I have some colleagues who've uh, been theorizing about space and sound and architecture and uh, so that point to the night before with this architecturally spe site-specific piece. And then I have um, a colleague, he's a, a, a media theorist and he's an expert on the local underground noise scene in, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I've curated for the last night is uh, uh, a group of uh, some of my favorite performers and, in, and they'll perform in that Osage space. So the middle night kind of looks back and then looks forward to the, the nights that sandwich it. Uh, uh, so that's, those are the things that are coming up next. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.